<clears throat> it's great to be here tonight and uh, moderate this talk with uh, Oliver. I really enjoyed reading the book. I think um, uh, it got a lot of prizes I read, so um, I was not surprised. Um, as uh, Arabelle said, I'm rather new to the US my, uh, myself. Um, and when I first arrived here, my impression was in talking uh, with, with people here that um, the image Americans, US Americans have of Germany is a very positive one. So um, not just with Democratic voters uh, or people aligned with the Democratic parties um, who probably especially like uh, Angela Merkel and her, her style of politics and her policy, um, she's kind of the opposite to the president you have right now, I would say. Um, <laughs> very calm, very unagitated, down to earth, and uh, she doesn't even have a Twitter account, uh, so that's a, a big difference. But even uh, I would, or I thought even voters um, aligned with the Republican Party would say that um, Germany with uh, the trade surplus it has with the US, uh, often criticized by Trump, um, uh, is an economic powerhouse, and, and there's has strong macroeconomic figures. Um, and. Oliver tells a different story uh, in his book, and it's titled Germany's Hidden Crisis. So uh, there seems to be a crisis, despite this strong um, economic uh, figures we might see from the distance. So um, if we can see this crisis at a first glance, what, what would you say, what is this character of the hidden crisis in Germany? Yeah, what is this, what is it about the, the crisis in Germany? Uh, I think, if you just look to the figures to author the data, Germany is compared to the world economy or most European countries doing well. Mm -hmm. um, in the last 10 years, they had a growing economy, they had a very tight labor market. Um, some people even spoke um, of a um, of new full employment society. This is the surface of a really powerhouse, but if you look behind this, you see that German capitalism has grown in the biggest, on in the upturn of the business cycle, about 2% a year, which is compared to the 1950s or 60s, where Ger the German economy has grown about 5% on average for, for a decade, really small. So even when you, when, you, when you think that Germany is doing well, it's compared to former times doing not so well. Mm -hmm. And th this has consequences because economic growth is a very, um, is, yeah, economic growth leads to the possibility of, um, of resources getting to the underclass, of uh, resources for the welfare states, just of social distribution. And this has, yeah, in the, in the end, a, resu a resulting distributional conflict. And this might be, or in my view, is the basic problem of, of, of Germany. It is doing well, um, but uh, it is not doing well enough to sus have the sustain a sustaining society of not so big economic inequalities. Mm -hmm. But I mean, you, you have a um, really um, well thought out argument, I thought, through the book, and it's, it's not, ju uh, not just about economic growth, but mm. you argue that there's, that there's something deeper in the economic structures of Germany with disadvantages some societal groups or classes, mm. as, you, as you would say. So what is, even if we say, even it, probably if there would be more economic growth, mm. this wouldn't uh, resolve the, the crisis in Germany, right? Sure. Uh, Germany is, uh, is just part of the broader Western world, and, and so far it is part of a capitalism which is getting more and more some kind of a post-growth capitalism, which does not mean that there is, not, there is no growth at all, but that you can't reach these former growth rates any, uh, anymore. And Germany is isn't an exception as well if you look to these um, economic inequalities which are related to this, uh, mm -hmm. to this kind. Um, the uh, German sociologist Ulrich Beck once called Germany a society of an elevator. And he coined this term uh, or this metaphor um, to describe a society where the rich and the poor 
have been standing together in an elevator and this elevator was going up. Um, and because it was going up, even if there had been huge difference between rich and poor, the difference didn't matter in, uh, anymore. Classes didn't matter anymore. Um, and this was the, um, the, the main point of, of Beck. And um, what I'm arguing is that despite we are growing, or Germany has grown and there's, there was new worlds produced, Germany had become more unequal, like most Western um, most Western capitalist countries, um, and in particular that the lower 30 or even 40 percent of German households, which experienced in, in the post-war society a real upward mobility, um, a real growth of of um, economic rights, um, a growth of possibilities to live their lives, that these people have experienced a lot of pressure on their wages, their life perspectives, and on their social situation. It has become, in general, in general more uncertain, more precarious, um, more with some problems in the or in the future certainties. Mm -hmm. so, so coming back to the discussion mm -hmm. about the trade surplus mm -hmm. of Germany, which uh, US President Trump heavily criticizes, but mm -hmm. is also criticized in the European, uh, European Union and Europe. Um, so would you say um, it is legitimate to criticize this, not because one country is exploiting the other one, but rather because Germany is exploiting a laborers, a labor workforce in creating like an, an advantage on the international stage? Oh, well, difficult question. Um, so capitalism is a, is a global system where not com companies do compete and nation states do compete. And Germany was very good um, in driving down uh, unit labor costs and to become very competitive in international uh, terms. And mm -hmm. so Germany became one of the most productive um, export nations in the world, behind China. Um, but part of its success depended um, on the international division of labor, because Germany was just building a lot of car, a lot of more or less good cars, because <laughs> As everybody know, knows, th th they are cheating very much. Um, but people like this car, and, and one of, um, I think, why Germany was doing so well, because um, in most new industrializing countries, like Ch China or India, there, there are new middle classes. Mm -hmm. And these middle classes, what do they buy if they have a new status? They, yeah. They buy cars, and particularly German cars. Um, so Germany was successful in selling cars to China, India, um, and very successful to, to sell cars to the United States, mm -hmm. um, and was successful to sell machines. Um, so the, the German machine in Bau, um, in uh, the, th the southern parts of Germany was very successful um, and was dependent on global integration. So there are basically two stories. One story is about international division of labor, and the other one is which Trump criticized. But this is, yeah, part of a game which every country does. Mm -hmm. um, in the, but if you look a little bit deeper to it, it's, yeah, I don't like it, but I have to say Trump, th there's a little bit of a truth in it, <laughs> what he's saying, B because just, um, Germany was so competitive, even in Europe, that most other, Euro other European countries had some problems because they had problems with their own exports, mm -hmm. and Germany was so strong. Mm -hmm. So a more balanced account of German exports and imports would be good for, in particular, the European economy, maybe for the world economy as well. Mm -hmm. um. <coughs> you did I just say that Trump was right? <laughs> <laughs> you did, you did. Um, we have that on record as well. So um, you, you talked about the 
elevator effect, so um, a period of growth um, in the 50s, 60s, and maybe even 70s um, in Germany, where everybody, every societal group or class profited from economic growth. Um, so what happened? What made the elevator stop? What factors led to a turning point in, into a different direction? There is no, no single factor which determined this development, um, but one part of the story or one factor is clearly um, the economic crisis of the early 70s, um, which introduced this new kind of post-growth capital, uh, post capitalism, the, the first international crisis of capitalism in the years of uh, 1972 and 1973. Mm -hmm. uh, the Bretton Woods system was abandoned. Uh, we have now free-floating economic um, systems of money. Um, so this situation um, was a situation where a new international competition was created and many G German companies reacted in a particular way to it. Um, they they decided, or the, st the, strategy, the, the strategy was now, yeah. after this crisis, they, that they bought new machines um, and these machines substituted labor. So they tried mm -hmm. to not to build more cars, but they rather tried to build the same amount of cars with less workers. Mm -hmm. um, so there, there was a creation of um, a new unemployment to put pressure on, on, on wages um, and many companies trying to flexibilize their production strategies. S still, it's the case if you're a worker for BMW or Mercedes or VW, um, you, you earn a lot of money and you have good labor relations. But the people who are included inside the, the labor relations of these big companies. They're getting smaller and smaller. And there's a kind of dualization in the labor market inside the companies. So for every good worker in a company, there's a temp worker. And this temp worker owns less than 50%. 50 per, uh, 50%. He has not the same labor regulations, not the, not the same social security. Um, and this wasn't, or this pattern wasn't clear in the 70s, but it was the beginning of, of this pattern, of this dualization of the labor market. A labor market of one part of people with good relations, good relations and one part with people of getting more precarious uh, labor relations. And this was one reason why, um, why now a segment of nearly one third of the labor market um, is atypical, uncertain, precar uh, precarious, and why this elevator effect for, in particular, the old working class and the, uh, the lower strata of German society has stopped, <laughs> and people now experience society very different. My, my parents and the, or the generation of my, of my parents saw society and the work society as, well, in my lifetime, if I'm working hard and I'm not doing some <laughs> shit, um, my life is getting better. And in particular, my children can expect a better life than me and expect a better life than my parents. Um, and exactly this pattern has changed. Many people now th see society as a society where if they're lucky, they don't have a, so a personal social decline. And they are very uncertain if their own children have a better life than themselves. Mm -hmm. So this has changed and people don't see, them, uh, see themselves standing in an elevator which is going up. They see themselves standing on an escalator. And this escalator isn't going up anymore, it's going down. And I don't know if you tried it, um, to run against a <laughs> down-going escalator. Um, I tried it when I was young and with lo uh, not so much weight. And <laughs> I succeeded for one or two times. Um, but for many people, their daily experiences, this escalator is going down, I'm standing on it, and I have to, to run against it every day. 
this is the competition, the general competition of society. They, they experience no actual social decline, but they have to run against it. And this mm -hmm. exhausts people. It makes them frightened, causes anxieties, causes a lot of, yeah, resentments against other people who are in competition with you and so on. So this is the, the, basic, the basic pattern, not, not a general social decline, but the, the possibility of social decline. Mm -hmm. Um, a fascinating chapter in your book mm. is about capitalism without growth, and mm. you talked about this, how growth is very necessary for capitalism mm. and um, how it doesn't function w without it. But then you, you, you refer to discussions, um, clever people have written about this, um, if there's a time when capitalism will level out, so there will not be any growth, mm -hmm. and um, that kind of feeds back into what's happening um, in our societies. So could you maybe explain this? Is there like a point when capitalism will stop in some way and not achieve any more growth? Mm -hmm. um, uh, capitalism is, is a very, very dynamic system, as everybody knows. Um, but this is a problem, um, and the, the, the idea of the classics of political economy, I'm, I'm referring a lot of to Karl Marx, um, and I think he was basically right, um, but Marx was not so original as many people th uh, think. Uh, he, he bought his ideas mainly from other classical political economists like Adam Smith and David Ricardo and, and, and John, St uh, John Stuart Mill. Um, they are the same generation of econom political economists and they shared or they had a common view about the development of a maturing capitalism. Like it's, it's growing, but the growth is always decreasing to an end where some kind of stationary state, a capitalism without, without growth. And so this is a contradiction in itself a very dynamic system which is not growing not growing anymore. I don't believe that there will be a certain time when there's actual no growth anymore and there is no possibility of growth anymore. But capitalism is always trying to get more growth in the last 30 years. First attempts have been Keynesian attempts, like the state is trying with a fiscal stimulus to, to create more growth. After that, neoliberal, neoliberal reforms like the deregulation of the labor markets, privatizations, try to create more growth. But all of these attempts created growth, but they created not enough growth to get on a new sustainable path of growth. And this this should make us all not frightened but critical because if capitalism tries harder and harder to create growth but it always fails and every creation of growth has side effects. The, liberal, the liberalization of labor markets had side effects, precarity. If we are investing more or even trying to get more f and Investment always means, and growth always means, we, are, we need more fuel. Um, we need more oil or gas and something else. So another side effect of, of growth would be a further um, a climate change. So I don't believe that we are getting back to this sustainable path of capitalism. And, I'm, and this is a, maybe the critical point, I'm even not sure if we should try to get back to this point. Because climate, climate change and the social divide is even so big, so big now, and we should rethink in a way how the economy is organized. Mm -hmm. You, you talk about very basic mm. principles mm. of capitalism, of capitalist societies. Uh, your, your analysis is very much focused on the mm. German case, but um, I hear a lot of agreement mm. tonight mm. here. So um, what would you say, what elements of your analysis um, speak to the U US society as well? Well, in, in my... To uh, sell your book here yeah. as well. <laughs> <laughs> in, You're right, so it, it's even the title. My, my book is about Germany. Um, but it is a book about Germany which always reflects the 
condition of advanced capitalisms. And in particular, the chapter on the political economy isn't about Germany alone. It is more about capitalism in, in general. And the, the ideas um, I refer to are uh, ideas of, um, in particular, uh, US economists um, who are not known as Marxist economists like Larry Summers or Paul, uh, Paul Krugman. Um, but basically, they share the same ideas like Marx or, or, or Müller. Um, they talked about even this capitalism without, uh, without growth. So you have in the US now a better growth rate in Germany right now. But it is very much dependent on the tax cuts uh, on of the, uh, of the Trump administrations, you have still, and global capitalism has still um, this kind of nearly zero interest rates or uh, cutting, uh, cutting interest rates. It's very unusual for a situation um, um, where the economy isn't in a recession. Mm -hmm. um, so the, the, the low interest rates reflect that the economy in its heart is not very healthy. You don't see it on the surface because there are a lot of new buildings in every, in every new city, but all these buildings are built because interest rates are so low, and this reflects that, on the other hand, pr the profit rates, so the profit in relation to the investments is not high enough. Mm -hmm. Um, let's turn to the political actors, because mm. um, the last chapter um, you write in your book is about the German party system, and um, that's what I do, research on political parties. Um, and in many conversations I had here, um, I felt kind of an envy of the German multi-party, or even Western European multi-party system. So um, as seen as there's more room for representation, if you have proportional voting, even smaller interest might be uh, represented. Um, but you kind of make the argument that um, this is not the case and that the two dominant parties, center-right Christian Democrats, conservatives, center-left Social Democrats, kind of converged and became similar and that even the smaller parties do not seem to pick up on this, maybe except for the new alternative mm. for Germany, which does it in a very particular populist way. So w w turning to the political actors, which would be responsible for doing something, about the problems you describe, what is your take on them? Hey, um, <laughs> yeah, you, you described it very correctly. Um, the the interesting thing about the German political system is that it transformed itself in the last thirty years, which is a long time, um, but very deeply. Germany was was a two and a half party system. Uh, with the Social Democrats, the Conservatives, or Christian Democrats, um, and the Liberals. And now Germany is a six-party system with a Green Party, um, a Left Party, and a new right-wing uh, right populist party. Um, so the, the party system, which was very stable and always um, brought clear majorities and, yeah, majorities for, poli for policies now is fragmenting and has a real erosion of representations. So that I, I think many people in the US have the same problem, that they don't feel represented by, um, by the parties and by the political elites. So many the, the turnout to, uh, to elections are very low in Germany. Um, it's even higher in Germany than the US, but um, both turnouts have been decreasing in the last uh, 20 years. The, the problem for Germany is that, these, that the old strongholds of the underclass, the Social Democratic Party, which had um, uh, nearly 42% of the votes in the 1970s, now is only reaching out to 16, maybe 20 percent of um, of the electorate. Um, so this all party, which was an, a, a very impor um, important pillar of I social integration in Germany, hasn't lost its function of social integration. 
and other competitors are coming in and yeah, challenge, challenge them. One challenger was the left party, or still is in a way, but even the left party has, has lost a lot of its steam. And now the Alternative for Deutschland, the AFD, um, the new right-wing populist party, is about uh, 12, sometimes um, 14 percent in, in, in the polls, and could become the new workers' party. It's not a left-wing party, but it rep represents more and more people from the, un uh, from the under, um, underclass. And this pattern is, it, so there, there are clearly very different political systems, but this pattern of people from the underclasses, and it's not only the workers, people from the lower middle classes, they do feel unrepresented from the political elites, they feel uneasy and alienated from the political system, and sometimes tend to use their right to vote to make a protest vote or even to, yeah, to shift to more authoritarian values. Mm -hmm. um, and this situation <coughs> is very comparable to the U.S. Mm -hmm. um, one special moment for the Social Democrats with the red-green federal government, which um, made extensive uh, labor market mm. and, and welfare state reforms uh, early 2000s, um, Agenda 2010 or, or Hart's laws. Um, is that the point? I mean, you, your analysis goes deeper, and, mm. and the things you talk about, they started earlier. but. <clears throat> was that the big mistake of the party? Did they lose uh, or did they disconnect to their party base and now it's up for grabs and the AFD is the new party who's uh, talking to the, to the voters which used to be um, aligned with mm. the Social Democrats? Yeah. The, 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 la the labor market reforms, the so-called agenda reforms um, in the um, early years of the century are clearly a tipping point um, in the history of the German political system. Um, so Germany was always very, not, not really boring, but <laughs> it, it took time, for or it always takes time for change. But the, the change in Germany, um, or I have to say it otherwise, um, so in Britain, there was Margaret Thatcher, and uh, in the States, there was Ronald Reagan, and both um, had a very straight neoliberal agenda and tried to implement the policies. And in Germany, we had Helmut Kohl, who was, well, yeah, like this very, very German guy, um, and he wasn't very successful in implementing or creating social change and political political change. The biggest social change was created by the Red Green, gov uh, Red Green government, and they made the biggest welfare cuts in German post-war post -war history. And this is one of, one of the paradoxes and one of the strategies in German history that the biggest welfare cuts are made by a social democratic party. Um, so the the deep alienation of the, the, the party and its former classical electorate never was, was, was healed, in a way, um, and still isn't healed. The party leadership always tries to make some symbolic changes, but still these reforms are, um, are implemented, and I think Unless the party leadership says openly, we made a mistake, and openly says to its electorate, we are sorry, and we want to do it now in another way, like more Corbyn style or Bernie Sanders style, they have no chance to reconnect. Mm -hmm. <coughs> I have one last question before mm. we can open up the floor, so think mm. about your questions. Um, in, in your book, you modestly state that you merely sought to analyze the problem and, and tell us about what's going wrong, mm -hmm. and there's not enough room to, to offer solutions. But maybe for us tonight, um, mm -hmm. you, you did a lot of research on this, so what, what would be potential ways forward which might improve uh, the situation? Do we need fundamental reform? You, you hinted at some mm -hmm. things already, or what would be 
options to, to correct the mistakes you, you point out? Hi. Um, <laughs> um, I love my position as a sociologist so much because my privilege is I can criticize, <laughs> <laughs> but I don't need, uh, don't need to answers. Yeah, to give answers. <laughs> if I must give an answer, I had maybe three suggest suge suggestions. The first one would be to recreate normal labor relations. This is a very, very German word and concept, um, but it means basically um, that you have labor relations where your job is a permanent job, you are included in, included in social systems, you um, have, you could expect a decent pension, and even if your boss doesn't like you, he, he can't sack you without proper reasons. Um, I've learned that in the US you haven't this laws like in Germany, it's called Kündigungsschutz, but there's an act, there is and was an actual law um, with, um, which was a boundary ag against yeah, uh, the, the, the seconding of people. Um, and these normal rela labor relationships are, in my view, a a deep foundation of social integrity and integration and of dignity. And mm. I, I can imagine that if we recreate such a society, and this would mean um, to recreate an inclusive so society, in particular for the underclasses, um, that this would create a situation where we could have more solidarity and m m more space to listen to each other and have a, m have a better political atmosphere and um, even more space to maybe to be open to integrate the migrants and so on. And this, this is one part and I would personally renationalize um, the public-private partnerships. First of all, the um, the Deutsche Bahn, the German railway system, uh, which is a mess. <laughs> Honestly, I was driving with the Amtrak here and your mess is bigger, <laughs> but, um, uh, 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 um, but your country is also bigger <laughs> and um, Germany, uh, so the this railway system was great and there, there could be a very good public transport system, which is a solution for social integration, the economy, and climate change. So it, um, this was mm -hmm. a, clear power, uh, a clear way for a new democratic society. Um, and not only the railroad system and the housing companies, um, which are making a lot of profits of poor people, um, and they are just getting too, or demanding too high rents and uh, not building enough, um, not building enough apartments for other people. So this would be part of this renationalization. I would, I would add that this nationalization or socialization should be controlled and watched democratically very much. So uh, we don't need some kind of state capitalism um, where um, only ruling elites have the control of these resources, but the people who live in these apartments or live in the cities, the, the, the users of the railway system, they should have a voice in it. And the third thing is, how could we have a better, how could we build better schools, how could we repair the streets, I, I sound like a politician <laughs> right now, um, is to tax people, and in particular to tax rich people. So there are a lot of rich people <laughs> in Germany. Um, and it is, it is not Germany, but in France, you all have heard of this cathedral Not Notre Dame. Yeah. Um, and uh, France is, they, they had a real, um, social movement in the last months is the Yellow Vests. And so I, I want to dig 
to dig too deep into this yellow vest question, but it was about taxes be because <laughs> um, Macron was um, wanted to cut taxes for the rich and to raise ta uh, raise the taxes for for um, in particular the, uh, the taxes for fuel for the poor people, but which was a problem for them, and th this revolt showed some of the conflicts inside society, and just in the night of um, the, the big fire in Notre Dame, the, rich, um, the richest families of France said, oh, well, oh, we have just a m billion in our yeah. pocket. Um, we can give it to, uh, to the church. So I think <laughs> they have another billion in the other, in the other pocket. <laughs> and um, uh, this could be taxed and mm -hmm. to give to, uh, to workers and the people who need it. And this is the same mm -hmm. situation in Germany. Okay, yeah. thanks. Um, yeah, we have time for, for some questions. Please mm. try to do be brief, no, no lectures, so <laughs> everybody gets a chance to talk. And mm. yeah, we can start right here. Just related to that, mm. what's the top tax rate in Germany? 43%. And um, the funny thing is, or the strategy that this, l this top tax rate was reduced by the Social Democrats as well. The the top tax rate under the conservative government by coal was 53%, which was very much better. And if you remind yourself to the New Deal area, the top tax rate was about 96%. I think this is a f fair new tax rate we can demand. Hmm. That's always kind of like Nixon goes to China. So the uh, social democratic parties do the welfare yeah. state reforms. And it's interesting because you have less opposition as than when a conservative or liberal party would, would do this. Um, yeah? So what is your theory on why people did not turn to the further left parties? They actually did. Um, so the a left party was always a difficult thing in Germany because of anti-communism and um, yeah, the SPD was very strong, the oldest social democratic, even socialist party in Europe. Um, but after Oscar Lafontaine left the SPD and there was this union of the old communist uh, SED PDS in Eastern Germany with this um, uh, split, Western split of the SPD in Western Germany, the, the link was created. And they have been pretty successful for two election terms. Um, and they earned 9% um, uh, nearly out of the blue. Um, but then something changed. This has a lot to do with Lafontaine's ego. Um, but also that the Linke tried to become an establishment party in itself. So it, it, in particular in, in Eastern Germany, it, try, um, it stopped to be the, the voice of the people not heard, and it tried to be the better government party. This was, uh, this was their claim. Um, and this claim, it didn't work out. Um, so people, in particularly since 2015, they wanted to have a party uh, to give a, a hard voice um, and to say, we want to give the establishment a message, but the left was seen as part of the establishment. And if the link, and they did not actually, had positioned itself more like Bernie Sanders or Jeremy Corbyn, which posi positioned themselves as more like an anti-establishment voice. They, in my view, could have been very successful to help the AFD down, but this didn't happen, so it's a speculation. And also, I mean, there's a lot of intra-party conflict in the left yeah. party um, because it's really strong, nearly Volkspartei in, in Eastern Germany and really weak. Uh, mm -hmm sometimes without parliamentary representation in the West, and there's a lot of groups inside of the party fighting over the right strategy, and that takes up a lot of resources yeah. as well. Um, yes, please. Uh, where, is, I mean, your three reform, you know, suggestions about where, where is the political support going to come from? It's not the SPD, and if the, if the Lenka is split down the middle, and even perhaps part of it going to the right itself, 
maybe that's too strong, maybe not. Where's it going to come from? It's not going to be green, is it? There is no potential actor right now. So, um, so yeah, the, the, the Greens, they are very successful right now, but in a way they are lucky because they have, political scientists call it the issue ownership. They have the issue ownership for climate change and, and green politics. In practice, well, they are very near the automotive industry right now. Um, but most people doesn't recognize it because they have fought for, fought for ecological um, topics their whole life. Um, yeah, and Die Linke, I, I think Rise Up is dead. Uh, Aufstehen. Yeah, uh, Sarah Wagenknecht, the leader of Rise Up, um, she stepped down. Um, and she even stepped down um, as the leader of the faction, um, or just said she um, wouldn't get into the next election uh, term. Um, what is it? What is Rise Up? Rise Up was an attempt by some politicians f from the Linke who had slightly the same critique as I formulated of the Linke. They said the Linke has become too soft, too, too less anti establishment, and wasn't relating to working class people anymore. Um, and Sarah Wagenknecht, a very vocal person, tried to build this um, a movement inside the Linke together with people from the Green Party and the Social Democratic Party to have a more like, you, you know, maybe this Mélenchon movement in, 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 in France. France um, had, or Mélenchon was very successful to create a cross-party alliance of, of, left, of left people. And this was an, an idea of it. But Wagenknecht made a terrible mistake, in my view. She she recognized rightly that there was a competition of between the AfD and the Linke um, of, on people who have been alienated of the system. But Wagenknecht's strategy was to adapt. So she's, she just thought, well, if I talk about the nation state, national sovereignty, and maybe that we should close the borders, then people from the right would come over to the left. I think this was completely wrong. Um, she should have been strong about against Merkel and the government and, and, and so on, and should have combined it with a more internationalist message and anti-establishment message. This should have worked out, but if in, yeah, in effect, she moved the political system further to the right. This was not her intention. She's, she's not a nationalist per se. She's not a racist or some, something else. It was more or less yeah, the, the result of a completely wrong strategy. I find it very interesting what's happening in Denmark. The social democrats now are actually becoming more anti-immigrant to some more, they're more conservative on immigration, which is an interesting sort of issue crossing uh, and I wonder if we need this in Germany too. We need a party that sort of takes the best parts of the left and the right and combines them in an intelligent fashion, and therefore overcome this way, overcome some of these issues that you raised. Um, I couldn't disagree more. <laughs> um, so so I, I, I'm very much pro-immigrant, and I, I, I think um, we have to build a renewed left. So. If you listen to me, you, it's not difficult to recognize that I'm a lefty. Um, um, but I think if there is a renewal, it should be very internationalist, pro-immigrant, and maybe anti-establishment, um, but not on these terms of closing borders and, and so on. So I think it's maybe on the European level as well. A European left party, yeah, this would be a great idea. Um, people like Varoufakis are trying to build this, but yeah, it's. I, I think it's a, a more project of a single person with a lot of ambitions, mm -hmm. um, and not a real serious political uh, project. But I think I. I mentioned it several times. I think how Jeremy Corbyn, in a really messy situation, has managed to 
bring labor back into the political game and even has now a real bid to become new prime minister is, is a really interesting way. And, 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 and Corbyn is always addressing the, the question of people who are alienated from the political system in another way. Um, he's always talking about to create a new society, to create a, a better society where everybody has a place in it. So he's, he's talking about alternatives. He's basically talking about socialism. Um, and I've written extensively ab about the history of social democracy, which was quite demanding um, because it was a very depressing history. <laughs> um, uh, but one of my take on it is that one of the problems was, I have to say, that there wasn't a sense of real alternatives anymore. And I think this is changing right now. Corbyn is talking about socialism, the DSA and the states are talking about socialism, and the economic elites, are, they're freaking out. Um, the, the Economist ha had a title of the, the millennial socialism in the US, and there's a, there's a famous book um, in Germany from, from Werner Sombart, why, no why There's No Socialism in the US. And it was pretty true for nearly 100 years. And now The Economist is talking about socialism in, in the US, and I think even if the people who support this idea do understand something clearly different than a European f uh, from the uh, term of socialism. It means a European welfare state. Um, the, the idea to think in alternatives of society is very necessary. I don't care if about the name. It mustn't be socialism. It could be real democracy or even <laughs> something else. But to have the idea of a, that we could have another society, this would be, yeah, it would be cool and um, a perspective for left parties. What, what's the chance of someone like Trump getting elected in Germany? Who would that be? <laughs> <laughs> or where would that come from? The German political system is pretty much stronger than the old Weimar Republic. Um, <laughs> and it is stable, so I, I think there's n no actual danger that we have a kind of Trump. But the, 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 the pace of the German political system is very dynamic now. So it, it, it could get become faster, but I think it's an open situation. It is not clear if the German political system gets more centrist in the, in the, in the next years, so that we have this kind of a permanent grand coalition because there's no other, no other option. Um, I, I think the most likely coalition will be a black-green coalition, uh, like the co um, a coalition of the Conservatives and the Green Party. Um, this is not the Green New Deal, but it's more like the cons conservative uh, Green Deal, um, like German cars without diesel. I can't <laughs> imagine what this could be. Um, but, but this is the idea they have. Um, on the other, but the, the rise of the IFD was very, very fast. Um, I have some hopes that it m that they now reached for the limit for now. Um, but if we looked into the history, we know that the NSDAP, the, the fascist party in Germany, was small before, before 1930. So the, the, the electoral base had been small, they had not so much dynamics, and in a cry, in a real big depression and crisis, things could get more dynamic, but I can't say we have a potential Trump or, or something else. I still think it's an open situation, and <coughs> it is as likely that, there's a, that there could be a new left. I mean, and also, it's, it's probably Merkel's last term, um, and she already stepped down as leader of, of her party. 
um, because of, of internal pressure. And um, I mean, there's going to be some movement in the Conservative Party as well. There has been a lot of tension, and it could be that the party becomes more conservative, more right, mm. and so the room for the AFD to maneuver becomes smaller as well. So, mm. like you said, it's an open situation. Yes? So the population, uh, the, the immigrant population, will be increasing every year going forward with um, global warming. It all doesn't, it doesn't feel good now, but what happens um, in 10 years or 20 years when the numbers increase fivefold, tenfold, until it's five million or, or ten million of all of Africa will be burning. It's already burning if you look at the NASA satellite. You ask the right question in a wrong way. Um, so I think we shouldn't think about it in terms of there will come millions of migrants in 20 years. We actually don't know and can't do know this. So, but we should think about to change the conditions that uh, make people to leave the country w uh, in which they are born. Um, in particular, to fight against climate change, to fight for better uh, global conditions that life is good everywhere um, in the world and you have to chance to particip participate right now in this kind of kind of movements but i think the first of all the history of migrant movement is all was always in fact very productive look to the united states even your actual president is an immigrant from germany maybe you sh should have shut down the borders <laughs> for a certain <laughs> point uh, <laughs> just to to let him or his parents or his family not in. Um, but most of the German people are not really born in, in a German way. The whole Germany's um, national soccer team, they are f f from a lot of nations. Uh, the whole story of, of the US is a, is, a, is a migrant success story. Um, and I think we need to fight for a better world and not to prepare people or not to prepare to stop people of trying to have a good life of themselves and on the other hand to help them. We have time for one last mm. or maybe we can have the last two questions together um, or the last three. <laughs> I'm just curious uh, where you see the economy heading at this point. There seems to be a resurgence of a lot of speculation at in, in trillions of dollars going on again. And with the, the failure of reforms in the wake of the last one, what do you think the consequences could be if there's a real crisis? Maybe, yeah. Uh, that's just a quick question. What do you think Germany can learn from the U.S.? And one last question. Uh, just a quick question. Is uh, RFA actually governing somewhere? No. They're, they're not governing um, anywhere right now, but there are rumors that in the <coughs> elections in Eastern Germany, in particular in um, Lower Saxonia, um, that the AfD is getting the second largest party in the next elections, and there are rumors that um, the that are the Christian Democrats thinking about a coalition with the, with the AFD. So if this happens, things will change very fast. Um, but we don't know. Um, I'm, right now, I'm, I'm really a little bit helpful that they, that they reached, reached their, their limits for now. Um, there has to be some kind of strategy, because the left party is strong. If mm. the AFD is strong, there is no majority for the established parties anymore. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so it will be pressure for the established yeah, parties. And to this work is why this. some people of the Linke are considering to have a coalition mm -hmm. with the Christian Democrats, which, which would be hilarious <laughs> because the Christian Democrats are anti-communist for their whole life. I, I'm coming from such kind of family. Um, um, but this would have a real side effect because if the Linke would go into a coalition with the Christian Democrats, the AfD could present itself as a real anti-establishment party because mm -hmm. every other party is, establish is establishment. Mm -hmm. What could Germany learn from the US? In my view, I, I'm, I, I talked to a lot of people in New York from this new left, from this uh, DSA left. And I think 
they are very well equipped for this new wave, which is coming now. They are talking about socialism, but not in a very sectarian way. They, they have their conflicts, but try to respect each other. And uh, it looks for me that for the first time that the US left has a real opportunity. I don't know how they, yeah, how they use it or if they can use it in, in a way. But for me, the, um, the American left is better suit, uh, suited for a new upturn of left politics than the German left right now. And yes, we are creating the biggest financial bubble of the f um, uh, recent history, much, much bigger than the last financial uh, bubble. Um, the, the debt of, of companies, so the, the last bubble was about private debt. Um, now this bubble is about company debt, and this is really, really huge. And the shadow banks are very huge. In, in China, um, there are many cities which are just built without people. It's just to create with cheap money buildings. So I don't know when the bubble bursts, and I don't even know if the bubble bursts in the, in the near future, but there is certainly a great financial bubble which is very, very dan dangerous. Um, but nobody knows, and I think it doesn't make sense to just specula speculate about it. We have to criticize it, um, how this yeah, economy works with very low interest, and interest rates with, is only in favor of the only rich people because they can, use, they can borrow money and just reinvest it um, for, for higher interest rates. So this is why even in these times of slowly growing economies and wage stagnations, the rich people are getting much faster rich than, than any other class, in particular the, um, the richest 5%. Um, and this is what the situation makes so dangerous. But yeah, I personally hope that the bubble does not burst, burst be just because a situation of a depression is mostly in favor of the right and not of the left, or was mostly in favor of the right in, in recent times, and the right is already very strong.